Thank you very much, Ruth. There is so much I want to ask you, and um, I can imagine that the audience does too, and we will have time for discussion in a second. Um, but I'm going to hold back with my comments, and I would ask you to um, remember your questions and comments, because we do have one more presentation before we then go into the discussion. <clears throat> and the next presentation, it's my pleasure to announce, is from Christina Kral, who is an artist based in Berlin who also exhibits internationally and is currently working as a research associate at the hybrid publishing lab of the Leuphana University in Lüneburg. Christina is interested in the transformative and utopian potentials of mundane objects and routines. And um, she has, through experimental models of facilitation and in altering collaboration, produced temporary manifestations that promote alternative hybrid forms of knowledge production. In addition to her solar work, Christina is part of the Finnish-German artist collective UCON, an advocacy group for unrepresented, unrepresented nations, experimental countries, and utopian practitioners, which you know is, I think, more than enough reason to have you here on this panel. And um, then when one goes into the projects that you've done with UCON, it becomes even more clear. Um, in her following presentation, uh, Christina will focus on the potential of play to produce social ties, empower shared visions, and propagate P2P practices for a citizen-driven future. She will talk about mechanics and approaches that encourage the exchange of ideas and the collaborative development of future scenarios by presenting select projects of her artist collective, UCOM, such as the Conference uh, for Utopian Technologies that took place 2014 in Athens, um, or the Summit of Practical Utopias. Um, I'm uh, sorry to hear, she told me ahead of time, that we won't be hearing about utopian bingo, but maybe we can talk about that in the discussion. Just like um, uh, I, I'm very, very curious to know more about situationist jogging, but um, you know, all, all these titles tell you very little, and I'm sure that you can say much more about the project, so I'm just going to give you the microphone and let you do your presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mark. And thank you all for coming here. Um, so uh, when, when I had this quick introduction with, um, with Mark, he was like, maybe you can also tell about how you got to UCON. And um, this is how, um, actually it combines a few different um, uh, eras in my life, because at the time when I first heard about UCON, I was uh, in New York and I just had uh, worked at IBEAM. I, I did a residency there and I was exploring um, um, like I was building uh, platforms to investigate alternative knowledge productions and to engage with either people who didn't know each other or, or peers who already uh, dealt with each other but in a different way. And um, that time was coming to an end and I was looking for um, a new home to, um, to investigate that further and to continue this, this part of my, my interest. And um, there was Facebook and there was this call put out by UCON, and it, it felt like it was calling me. So I um, declared my love and devotion for them, and I've been a member ever since. Um, and UCON, as, as you already said, it's a, a, it's a collective. We're half Finnish, half German, and we're six members. And what really brings us together and also ties us together, because we're very different and uh, with different tempers, is this fascination for utopias and this fascination for uh, experimental forms of facilitation and, uh, as I said, uh, alternative forms of knowledge production. And um, we built these platforms where people can exchange in unconventional ways and imagine alternative scenarios for the current system of society. And UCON itself was born out of the first summit of micronations, which uh, took place in Helsinki in 2003. Um, it brought together these alternative um, nation states and kings and queendoms, and it opened up a space for a debate, um, a political uh, discourse on how, uh, on utopia, autonomy, and self-realization. And it took the, it imitated the structure of a G8 summit 
and then employed these traditional seminar models. And while these delegates um, met each other for the very first time face to face and they could exchange each other, uh, like not exchange, <laughs> exchange each other, but uh, share their concerns and acknowledge one another, this um, official character of, of these interactions formed trenches between the discussing sides rather than, and it created hierarchies and, and focused on differences rather than looking for commonalities and, and shared approaches. And um, so um, the only thing in the end after the conference uh, the delegates could agree upon was to meet again. And they put the hosts of the first summit in charge uh, to put up the second conference and this is how Ukon was born. Um, and this, this experience led us to, um, led us to explore uh, alternative ways of interaction and we quickly realized that game was really, uh, a really fruitful tool to, to investigate that. And one of the um, earliest and biggest influences in our development was Buckminster Fuller's world game. Um, I don't know, it's, it's not of his, one of his most famous works, but according to him, um, his, um, his most important contribution to society. And he created the world game as a subversion for the um, so-called military war games, uh, but also as a proposal for an alternative system for education. So he wanted to install a game rather than a curriculum as a platform of, of learning. And um, he wanted to uh, approach it with a design science approach to deal with all the problems with, uh, of the planet Earth. And it was like a, a logistic game where you would, um, how to redistribute um, all the resources of the planet. And he called it a game to lower the threshold of participation, to really make it accessible to, um, to everyone and not already to the ones who were in power and deciding what was going on. And this, this truly, um, this truly um, in, influenced our, um, this, this concept influenced us and we decided to develop our own um, curious game-like journey to, to develop alternative proposals to the world and we called it the Ukon game. And it's based on a really simple um, thought experiment. Imagine the world uh, comes to a complete halt and everything stops and there's no more business as usual. And only you and your players, you can tinker with the world as you please. What would you do? Um, what would you change? And how would you convince your fellow players to go along with the changes? And what about the consequences? And um, I'm not gonna go deeper into the structure because th the game takes up to six minutes or four days. Um, uh, <laughs> and it's, uh, but in essence, you can imagine it uh, as a hybrid or a blend of, a, of an intense workshop uh, a, a party and a therapy session all in one. And the immediate goal of the game, uh, I would say, is to, to be a catalyst for utopian thinking. And it bridges um, the areas between art, design, and education. And it, uh, it tries to, to, to tickle out and uncover ideas and novel scenarios that have not yet been considered. And this can be absurd or uh, flamboyant or, or even terrifying. Um, so, oh, I didn't show you, okay, but I'll show you this, this one later. Um, nope. <laughs> uh, so over the, over the course of um, the past eight years, this, the Ukon game has continuously um, developed and evolved and, and, and changed. Um, this is due in part to the, to the members who facilitated the game, but also uh, to the settings in which it was played, and most importantly, the players who, um, who were playing the game and engaged with it. So over the, um, within this process, we, um, we focused more and more on a, on a modular structure, so we could adapt to any con condition. And you can look at it almost uh, as a utopian toolbox. So for every question we had or every, every bottleneck we ran into during the games, we would design a new game module or a new facilitation mode to investigate exactly that. And it's, um, for example, how to turn a wacky, crazy idea into a plan for immediate action or how to, um, what else, like how to map collective knowledge or how to how to document a thought process and be able to share it with others. Or even uh, one tricky thing, like 
not only to come up with a crazy idea, but to, uh, to make the, de uh, the, the player deal with that idea longer and push it further, allow it to mutilate it or be stolen, um, and, and push beyond that comfort zone. So um, um, I guess, as you can imagine, uh, the, the game is never the same. And it's always uh, this kind of uh, uh, an area of experiment and experimentation. And I brought for you um, some of the manifestations just to give you our, um, some impressions and uh, uh, some visual examples. Um, so this, uh, this is one of the first Yukon games. It was played in Reykjavik. And compared to that, uh, right, the next slide, this is one that was hosted in Vienna in a theater and it immediately had a more like expressive theatrical feel to it. Um, in Brazil during the um, eighth Mercosul biennial, um, we were put inside a geodesic dome, very fitting, and we had to build a very sturdy set because over a course of three months, uh, busloads of, of school children would daily come through and play the game as part of their school curriculum. Uh, and this was the first time we had to um, kind of we couldn't, we couldn't, um, um, yeah, like improvise because we had to wrap the game and um, instruct others to uh, to facilitate it for us. And in the next example, this is um, uh, for 37 manifestos. Um, it took place in Berlin. And um, this was the first time we had to create a hybrid situation. It had to function as a display for, for all the visitors who came. Uh, to that show, and we had to be able to activate it whenever we facilitated the game. And this um, was last year during uh, the CAFA Biennial in Beijing, and here we were within the theme called uh, uh, Game Theory, and we put up six game island or, or game stations, uh, and we provided instructions and, and supporting props for the visitors to individually experience part of these modules and after that have it an, altered, uh, um, an altered experience to an artist show or an art show. And this, as you already saw, um, it's the personality modification device. And it, was, it used to be an integral part of the, the Ukon game in the beginning, but then it, it became a dartboard. Uh, and in its, latest, in its latest version, it's a, it's a little postcard that you can put in your pocket uh, so you can modify your personality on the go. Um, so, so I I wanted to 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 give you like this this rough cross section of of, of the Ukon Games history to really um, uh, demonstrate that we use um, that we use game design and facilitation and especially the experience to um, as a form of research for our practice. There is a lot of failure with, involved within and uh, a lot of changing and, and developing it further. Um, so, and all this, um, all this previous research and um, the experience that we collected and these little modules that we designed, um, they served as resource for uh, the conceptualization of the second conference, uh, which took place uh, ten, th ten years later in 2013. And um, since the first summit of Micronations, um, not only our understanding and ambition regarding facilitation had um, had evolved, but also our interest in micronations uh, had slightly shifted, if and um, or expanded, I would say. Um, so we were more and more interested into um, practical or everyday utopian practitioners. Um, what it meant to be practically utopian within the constraints of, of everyday reality, and therefore we called it the the conference of um, practical utopias. Um, can I already show a new slide? Sorry, no, great. Well, I can just show you this and let it linger. Um, so, for for this conference, we brought together thirty five um, activists, artists, uh, communication coaches, uh, visionaries, academics, um, game designers, and we brought them brought them onto the island of Brioni, which is located in the Croatian Sea, um, uh, well, in the Adriatic Sea on the Croatian side. And we organized this event together with Drugo Mora uh, from Croatia and in, in dialogue with Electra uh, Productions from the UK. Um, 
Oh yeah, and the, actually the location was already uh, agreed upon during the first micronations. It was a proposal by Ivan Novak from the NSK state. Um, and the, the game, um, sorry, I already took that away. The conference this time, uh, a four-day conference, uh, took, the, took the form of a four-day reality game. And um, so game rules um, determined the interactions among the, the attendees. And we, we turned the entire island, it's not very big, but um, all the sites and infrastructures into a playground to facilitate and support um, unconventional collaborations. And I think, um, maybe just show you this. Um, the, the island is quite special. It's also special, it's a very controversial place, so we thought this, this could be an interesting place to hold this kind of, uh, host this kind of event. Um, you, you have to imagine, it used to be a, a stone quarry and then later turned into a luxury retreat for the very wealthy. And it was uh, Tito's uh, former summer residence um, and, and he experimented with organizational structures of a whole society and that had a strong impact on Yugoslavia or ex-Yugoslavia. And uh, Brioni was also a really important uh, place uh, in the forging of the non-alignment movement. And so you have uh, self-managerial socialism meet uh, international celebrities and world leaders. And I was told that the island was completely built from scratch, so even the pla quite utopian actually, that all the plants and trees had to be imported. Um, and um, the delegates would always bring gifts, so they had to install a, a, a zoo with giraffes and, and, and elephants. I mean, not all the animals are still there, but still a number of them. Um, so. This seemed to be um, a beautiful and provocative place uh, to think through that you can alter a system and you can imagine that um, and you can um, restructure social life and at the same time you have to problematize this desire. Uh, and I will pick out just one particular thing that we introduced for the summit and it, it's also to, to reflect a little bit on this capture all theme of this transmediale. Um, it's the question of um, how how do you capture dynamic thought processes? Not just document an event and have nice pictures, but how to how to document that process so you can can use it later on. So um, for this summit, we introduced a very personal and non-intrusive way to document the event. Uh, upon arrival, we gave every player um, um, a logbook and they could take it and, and uh, capture the event while it was happening. And it was, uh, there were three golden rules. Um, whenever someone asks you a question, be generous in your response. Um, second, uh, dispend your disbelief for the time being. And third, wherever you are is the right place and whoever you're with is the right person. Uh, and then you had to sign a pledge. That's the center. Um, and we had pages for free note taking, just to take whatever um, whatever you find interesting. But also some of the some of the pages corresponded to the program, and it facilitated activities. And uh, you could also rate your uh, personal state of uh, utopian uh, emergence on, on every single page. It's it's down. Well, you, it's almost impossible uh, to read, but it's down there. Um, and what was really beautiful, I thought, for this, uh, what worked almost naturally, is that uh, on the one hand, it, uh, it instigated activity and, 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 and processing of material, but on the other hand, it also created this moment of reflection uh, within the same device. So people would take the book wherever they went, and then um, whenever there was a moment where there was no programming, you would see them sit down, have a drink, gaze, and, and then take down their reflection. And that was a really beautiful thing to see. Um, unfortunately, we failed in um, uh, using that content that was generated during the conference on the island, like to, to, to work with that material. We did this later, um, but I think it would have been a nice closure to process that material. And that brings me almost to the, uh, to the last um, example. Um, last year we were invited, um, actually by Daphne, um, to host a three-day uh, conference, the conference of, um, um, sorry, I must get it right, uh, the Athens Conference for Utopian Technologies, etc. And with uh, uh, technologies, I refer here to uh, more, more social technologies. 
and um, we, we hosted this three-day conference in the center of Athens and uh, together with uh, curator Angela Girardi, who's from the US but now based in, in Amsterdam, we invited the attendees to, um, uh, to experience the, the city in, in absurd and, and, and novel ways. So we used game mechanics again and in a, in a situationist fashion they put a layer on top of the city by parasitically using the sites and the infrastructure. And this was to change uh, your own perspective. And there are two things uh, also in respondence to the, the Summit of Practical Utopias. Again, we used a logbook uh, to capture the event, but this time we used it as a um, as game currency. So you had, to, you had to, first of all, you had to fill it out entirely, but on the last day you would have to process that material almost in a competition like. So, uh, we, uh, there was a moment of, of exchanging uh, your observation and impressions. You had to remix that material, create no, new scenarios and pitch it to the others. And there was also an, um, a competitive exhibition of um, bizarre utopian machines that were created during the event. And another thing, um, in Brioni, um, as I, as I mentioned, it was a very special place and, and the people had to be flown in and dispersed afterwards. And, and here in Athens, um, we worked within the turf of the, the participants. And so once we left, they could not only use the tools, but they could also in continue to engage with the city. Um, and also the group who shared that experience, they, they had the potential at least to continue um, exchanging with one another and collaborating. And I find this a very, um, a, a very sustainable thing to, to look at. And also I would, uh, I do like the idea to seek the, to seek the very magical and special within ordinary settings. And it's also for Ukon, for us, it was to expand, uh, ex expand the playground and move beyond a safe zone. Um, yeah, and this is also how I um, want to end that um, these, these experiences that we gathered, um, they are also fruitful beyond game territory. And I think that's why it also makes sense for me to engage with it. And um, yeah, that's I guess that's I guess is it. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Uh, um, thank you, Chris Christina. That was actually a three-point landing. You told me you were going to go beyond time, but you were under time. So, you know, we, we are completely within the framework of the, you know, rules that were laid out for me of how, how to do this. The um, next uh, step is I, I actually get to respond for five minutes, and then we will successfully open up the discussion so that you can all ask your questions and give your comments. <clears throat> um, I'm, I'm going to try and sort of sum up what I just heard. Is this, these rich examples? Uh, um, you know, go go much m f further beyond than that which is normally um, you know discussed when when one talks about gamification. Okay, the g people who talk about gamification usually come from marketing, and they talk about putting a game layer over the world, over you know non-gamic activities, and they're usually thinking about you know giving out points, having high scoreboards or leaderboards as they're called, and awarding people badges you know when they get a certain amount of points. That's all they're talking about. Okay, it's a very very thin concept of game, and the question is is that even fun, and is it even a form of play? Okay, that's gamification. What you guys are talking about, I think, are very very rich forms of play which which access you know this this phenomena in in a number of different dimensions the, the first one that I see in, in both both you know approaches is you know approaching the world in this mode of as if you know you're looking at play your place it's like how can we reimagine the neighborhoods we live in in a different way using the simple tools of world creation on the one hand drawing on the other hand you know making a game and then reimagining our neighborhoods, just, just allowing us to have the freedom to, to, to ask us, well, how would we like things to be differently? And, and, and the same is, you know, whether it's the Ukon game, you know, the world stops, what do you do? Or, um, you know, this, this engagement with, um, 
uh, real spaces uh, mediated through, you know, a set of uh, sort of uh, rules that are meant more as impulses to sort of uh, break routines and maybe um, develop creative new ways of looking at spaces that one normally knows or looking at social interactions in a new way is also operating in this mode of as if. And, and, and maybe that's the main, main difference I see happening here, whereas you, Ruth, take the uh, real world spaces and pull them into this virtual gaming space where people can um, mess around with it and overlay their fantasies on that. You are taking this, these rule systems and overlaying them on real world spaces. So there's actually two two opposite directions, but, but very, very similar things going on. And, and what, what's going on is really in both cases, I, it's, it's what the play theorist, and, and play for me is the broader term, you can do this differentiation in English, right? You, you play games, but play doesn't have to occur in a game. It can also be more free form. But um, what, what we have in these two examples, or these two approaches, is, is really what Brian Sutton Smith, the play theorist, calls the, the, the highest form of play. You know, it's, it's the play of creation, a play that, that creates rule systems, changes rule systems, you know, hacks rule systems, modifies them. And, and in, in both cases, I think we're, we're really dealing with the highest form of play. And it, if you think of this in an art history context, it really um, reminds me of a lot of the stuff that the Situationist International was calling for, you know, over half a century ago, tearing down the, the you know, artificial wall between life and play, um, you know, and really accessing these potentials of play to reimagine the world, whether through processes of derive, you know, um, uh, well, actually, no, actually, detournement, taking existing spaces and, um, you know, putting them in new contexts or, or, or giving them a new spin so that they, you see them differently. Or I, I could even see what you're doing as a form of, you know, psychogeography, you know, this mixing of, you know, this, this imaginary space of people living in neighborhoods and, and, and seeing how they would like to see them differently. So th this is, you know, this is me sort of just... Um, uh, you know, free styling off of what you presented. I, I think both 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 forms are very impressive examples of, of the topic of the panel. You know, they're very inclusive forms of play. I think you know when looking at this, one might even think about maybe we're at the beginning of a renaissance of collective play forms because, you know. Um, in the past, in, in pre-modern times, play was always conceived of as this collective activity. And only recently, in the last 200 years, it has become thought of as a more and more solitary thing. You know, um, uh, Brian Sutton Smith talks about you know, this, this idea of play as a field of self-development and self-experience that people talk about in pedagogy or, or you know, in um, uh, psychology is, is this very, very modern idea. And um, when you look at pre-modern times, it's all about the festive, it's about collective identity, it's about people coming together and really um, reimagining the world. So um, I'm, I'm very thankful for these two presentations.